Good evening and welcome. Uh, we are going to begin in just a few minutes. Uh, we would like to just allow a few more minutes for uh, those who registered for the event to join us. Uh, meanwhile, please make yourselves comfortable and check out the information on the screen. Mitch, I so love that picture and that hat. It's beautiful. She would not have been pleased. <laughs> no. um, yeah, but uh, I love it. And it was for a book. I'm actually in a book called Surviving This Shore, which is all about transgender seniors. I want to make sure that you know about it. I would love to check it out. Mm -hmm. I'll send you. Uh, I'll send you the link to it. It's a, a guy who uh, has his master of fine arts, but the they present shows all over the country, and it actually might be something that Issaquah might want to get at some point. You can get these big, the big um, photographs, and then. Uh, his partner, both in life and and in this project, uh, did interviews with everybody then that that whose picture is on there, and you can cho choose it for you know to to have it like in a library or in a public space or whatever. It's really kind of cool. Wow, definitely. Yeah, well, let's let's talk about it. I would love to check it out. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay, so it looks like we are a couple of minutes in. Uh, we do have about uh, 20, a uh, little bit over 20 folks who uh, registered for the event. So I know that uh, we're going to have more um, guests uh, join. Um, but I would suggest that perhaps we want to be mindful of everyone's time so we can go ahead and get started. Give me just a moment to change your roles and we can get started after that. Hannah, if you are okay, you can take off the slide now. Thank you. And Mitch, you are now the presenter. So welcome everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for spending this hot evening with us. Um, and welcome to our cultural conversation series event celebrating Pride Month. Uh, the cultural conversation series are meant to increase awareness, uh, promote community education and inclusion. My name is Maren Kanegrilla. I'm the human services manager here at the city of Issaquah. And along with my team, um, Marisol Viser and Hannah Roberts, tonight we will be your hosts for this event. Thank you again for spending your evening with us. So before we begin, I would like to um, just go over a few reminders. Uh, we would like to invite you and remind you to um, please keep your comments positive. We welcome questions uh, that foster an authentic, respectful, and genuine conversation. Uh, and we would like to encourage everyone to just treat everything that you hear with an opportunity to learn and grow. During the presentation, we will encourage participation with comments, questions, and remarks. Uh, you can use those um, in the chat box, uh, or you can also raise your virtual hand at the end 
um, and we will be glad to mute you so you can ask your questions. If anyone calls in, uh, you can just uh, raise your virtual hand by pressing star key. Star three, I'm sorry. Um, I also want to just mention that during the event, there will be a few brief videos shown. Uh, the content of the videos, it's only for educational purposes and uh, illustrative purposes only. And so um, the, any showing of the video does not imply any affiliation with the television network or any commercial promotion of a show or celebrity or um, anything like that. And um, with that, I would like to again just um, welcome everyone and note that um, the cultural conversations are really part of our commitment as, as the city uh, to um, be more welcoming and inclusive um, and to um, abide by the commitments that we made to listening to a diverse range of opinions, to continuing the dialogue and sharing what we've heard uh, and implementing any change as a community. Um, and so today's event uh, is an educational presentation uh, featuring Mitchell Hunter, training manager at Gen Pride in Seattle. Um, and I'm um, so, so honored to have Mitch with us tonight, who will highlight the historical context and framework um, for the shared lives and experiences of the LGBTQ plus adults. Each year, the month of June is designated Pride Month to commemorate the Stonewall Riots, which occurred in June of 1969 and are generally recognized as the catalyst of the LGBTQIA plus rights movement. On June 1st, 2021, Mayor Mary Lou Pauley proclaimed June as LGBTQIA plus Pride Month in the city of Issaquah. Um, a rainbow flag was uh, raised at City Hall um, in honor of June being the national LGBTQ pride. Um, also, this event is part of our way to recognize and celebrate Pride Month. So again, going back this evening, as I mentioned, we welcome Mitch Hunter as our presenter. Mitch uh, is an activist leader in the transgender, non-binary, gender diverse and LGBTQ communities. Serving on the Seattle's LGBTQ Commission, uh, Mitch joined, uh, jointly created policy leading to Seattle all gender restroom law. Uh, he works with corporations, healthcare facilities, institutions, faith communities to further, to further inclusivity. Mitch is currently engaged as the training manager for Gen Pride in Seattle. For those of you who might not be very familiar, Gen Pride is a Seattle based organization that provides resources and support to local communities. The mission of Gen Pride is to empower old, older LGBTQ adults to live with pride and dignity by promoting, connecting, and developing innovative programs and services that enhance belonging and support, eliminate discrimination, and honor the lives of older members of our community. And so with that, with further ado, I would welcome to the screen Mitch Hunter um, to show his educational presentation. Hi, Mitch, welcome again. Hi there, Monica, and uh, I have just uh, the pleasure of having a team behind me or alongside me, I should say, tonight, Marisol and Hannah, and it's uh, it's really exciting to be able to present with a team of folks. Um, I I will just reiterate that uh, it is somewhat of a though though sometimes this is digital and we kind of think we're all separated and and it's you know we're not it's not live. I want to encourage you to, to think about this as an engagement uh, opportunity for engagement. So there'll be some questions that I will pose from time to time, and I'll ask you to enter your information in the chat. I will, um, I will comment and, uh, uh, I will get help, uh, from Marisol, uh, about, you know, kind of that content. I encourage you, if you have questions as we go along, it's going to be kind of fast and furious to make sure that I can get all the content in tonight. 
And um, so if you have a question that you'd like to, you, that you think, oh, I'll forget by the by time later, go ahead and write it in the chat and kind of park it in there. We'll treat it like a parking lot. And then towards the end, I think that we'll be able to have a few minutes for questions. And then in the middle, I may um, also ask for you to raise your hands and do a little bit of discussion with me. So we're going to try it out. And uh, the first thing up is going to be a poll. I have some questions for you um, that is are actually true false questions. And we're going to take this kind of poll. Uh, you should see a little window appear um, within your framework. And there you go. I am going to be able to view this as well with you. And I've written the polling questions here um for you um just in case you need to see them larger so go ahead and and check the true false on those questions and we'll give it a couple of minutes and we'll have a little bit of a result to see kind of how we are in that and then we'll take off and then you'll notice that we'll have the same poll towards the end of the presentation just to see if there's some changes in some of your answers um, and that'll be kind of exciting to see. All right. Take a little look, see at those. It's okay if you don't know, just put down something that you'd like that you think is closest. And we'll be able to tell in the in um in a bit. We're we're gonna give you a full two minutes for that. So we got an, another couple minutes, to, uh, I mean seconds to come to finish that up. And for those of you who are just joining, Mitch, I think we have a couple of uh, attendees who are just joining. So perhaps we can just remind them that what we are doing now is we would like to invite you to answer the questions. We are doing a brief poll uh, at the very beginning, and you don't have to worry about getting this right. You're not being graded, uh, but we would love for you to participate in the poll. like a few people are still in progress. I'm just going to give it another minute until we have a few more answers. Great. Thank you, Hannah, for monitoring that. And I'm really excited to be here with you this evening and glad you decided to give some time up on this really warm evening. So really appreciate it. And I'm sorry, Monica, were we supposed to do something special for folks that are joining by call? Um, or and actually, I'm also, I just got um, I'm not sure if those who are on the call on the phone, if they can um, answer the poll, that is a great question. But I also just got a message. Chelsea, thank you so much for letting us know. It looks like um, Chelsea joined from the browser. And so she, because of that, she does not have the feature of responding. She cannot respond to the poll. Um, so um, okay, it, it looks like, yes, um, I remember, but that not everyone can can participate in the poll. Um, okay. so sorry for that. We can also email the questions out or feel free if you see the questions on the screen. And if you would like to just respond in the chat, we can make sure that we, we capture those as well. Yeah. And it's not a big deal. It looks like we have probably everybody who's going to be able to respond, respond. So I'm going to go ahead and close okay. that poll. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you. All right. Looks like I forgot to say submit. 
So it told me how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right. And it looks like the results should be pulled up on the right hand of the chat screen. If you scroll down, you can see each answer and, and uh, how things were responded. So if everybody wants to take a quick look at that. Yeah, that's great. Okay, um, that, that's really very interesting. And we're gonna move right along now. There is a vitality, a life force, an energy, a quickening that's translated through you into action. And because there's only one of you in all time, this expression is unique. And if you block it, it will never exist through any other medium and it will be lost. This is one of my favorite quotes by Martha Graham. So the, the crux of this is that we're all unique. Each one of us has a purpose and our purpose is simply to be all of who we can be and all of who we are. So as we think about this in terms of, um, of learning or climbing into the experience of maybe someone that we're not as familiar with their experience. Um, it's just a reminder that each one of us has something unique to contribute to the universe. And that if we're not here to do it, nobody else can. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection, sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's, a, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, I'm down. I know what it's like down here and you're not alone. Sympathy is, Ooh, it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no, you want a sandwich? Uh, empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah, and we do it all the time because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. So connection in, in terms of the, the, the way, one of the ways that Brene Brown uses it is, it's the energy that exists between people when they actually feel seen, heard, and valued. Uh, when they can give and receive without judgment, 
and when they derive sustenance and strength from that relationship and that connection. So what we're attempting to do today is even though we're going to sort of talk about a people, it is the people that that I identify with. It is my people. And so we're not so much talking about as as offering you the opportunity to come along to uh, to to engage with us as a different culture, maybe of folks than those that you know about or feel connected to necessarily. And just to remind you that empathy is, in fact, a skill. We can learn, we can practice, we can improve. And so I'm giving you that option this evening to do that. So it's remember perspective taking. We want to stay out of judgment. We want to recognize the emotion in another. And we want to communicate emotion to each other and to one another. So I want to talk a little bit about this uh, section of, of history. I'm going to talk a little bit of the history of discrimination that many LGBTQ folks have experienced and the impact that it has on our lives. Um, and it continues to impact us as we age and as we are learning more about uh, trauma response and how that how that actually affects us physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually for many of us. So um, the couple of things to keep in mind is that everybody has a story to tell and our identities are uniquely shaped by these um, not only by our sexual orientation and our gender identity and expression, but also things like race and class and ableism and um, any other kinds of identities that come into play. So in uh, cultural, ethnic uh, identities. So it's just in, important to realize that there are biases that we have and we don't often and uncover them until we actually step on them and then go, oops, yeah, just stepped in that hole and realized, oh, that's a bias. Yeah, I, that's that's a myth. Like that does like I, that, that may not even be real. So tonight's an opportunity to kind of step into a little bit more of the stories um, of some of my people of the rainbow. Um, this is actually. Um, is actually a slide that um, that talks a little bit about history in terms of the 1950s. And this is just an idea about perspective taking. It is a promo for a show that's on HBO Max or was supposed to be or will be coming. Who knows how those things work? But here it is. We arrested around 3,000 homosexuals. The police department knows they're sex deviants. 1952, admitting to being gay, I gave 15 years to life. Cops would contact our employers, publish our names and addresses in the paper. We were going to lose our jobs, lose our homes. We were tired of being victims. I declared under oath that I was homosexual. I wasn't ashamed of it. For the first time, we went in saying we had the right to be who we are. We should be standing up on our hind legs and demanding our full equality. We are all fed up. You can be proud of being gay, proud of being yourself. That in itself is radical. Are you a man or a woman? Well, it is great for having to determine what is a man and what is a woman. Sick and tired of being shot to People who are just coming into their own in the world must feel as dramatic about it as they possibly can. We can't just put ourselves being attacked, pushed around again and again. Something fast. This can't force us into your boxes anymore. We are not going. What do you say? So many of our elders on whose shoulders we stand started their lives um, having been viewed negatively and subjected to severe discrimination. Um, 
police uh, w raided people in their homes. They raided places of business. They raided clubs and and bars and other places where people um, connected and came together to celebrate with each other. Um, and the result of that was that your name was printed in the paper. It was printed in the paper that you were arrested. So the next day, you often lost your job. Many people lost their families, uh, access to their children, access to any sort of livelihood, your community standing within. Um, and so a lot of our seniors that are actually are in their 80s and 90s, um, they they were so severely impacted that very oftentimes they chose not to come out or not to be publicly known. And that's called the gen silent or the silent generation. So some of those folks um, actually never have, have come to a place where they feel comfortable being fully known, even though many of us actually do know them. So um, just to give you a little bit of, um, of a quick introduction, um, my own story. I've lived every letter of LGBTQ. I, I first came out as a lesbian to myself in 1978. I was about to go into college and uh, to my family in 1983 after I graduated college. And I I knew that that it was part of my story and it certainly was um, the closest I could get to being male. I, I confessed to my mom when I was five years old that God made a mistake and I was supposed to be a boy. That didn't sit real well with my mom. So she rushed me off to a child psychologist first and second to the preacher. So um, he was quite confused and tried to explain some of the things in the universe, but um, really he was just mostly confounded by the questions that I had to ask. So. In about uh, 2001, 2002, I had met the first person in my life that was uh, tr had transitioned from female to male. Uh, they were in a, a chorus, a choir with me, and uh, he became my kind of go-to guy. That was the guy I asked questions, and I had asked enough questions by 2002 and found a doctor and uh, got um, psychologically uh, uh, tested so that I could progress and uh, medically transition, which meant that I began to take hormones in 2002. Um, by, by another 10 years later, I actually decided to live very out as a transgender man um, because I knew that there were a lot of people in my life who couldn't live their lives out and would have lost jobs or opportunities because of that. And I, I applied for and was on the Seattle LGBT Commission and, uh, and began to move my life forward in that way. Um, it's important to know that many of us that transitioned prior to the 2000s um, and even prior to, to that, we're actually told when we were going to transition that we should change our name, uh, divorce any ourselves from any family or relationships that we had, um, pick up and move to another state, and pray and make sure that we never get sick so that we would never have to have emergency surgery. So that's kind of where we came from, and thank God we've come a long way. Now I have the opportunity to work with hospitals, clinics, and uh, institutions like the UW Medical Center in order to teach transgender health and to be a voice for equitable insurance representation for trans and non-binary people. For transgender people. A secure payment doesn't mean protecting yourself from someone buying sneakers with your card. No, if you're transgender, a secure payment means paying for something without being judged, questioned, disrespected, humiliated, harassed, even assaulted, simply because the name on your card doesn't match how you identify. 
This is about more than just keeping a card safe. It's about keeping us safe. True name by MasterCard. The first card that allows you to display your chosen name because that's who you truly are. Some of the things that are so simple that we take for granted. So to me, when I saw that Citibank was a uh, part of this true name uh, card, it meant the world to me. Uh, the kinds of things that most of us don't think about when we have to put our card down or have a police officer that pulls us over and asks for our ID. Um, we never have to think about the fact that the picture and the gender marker may not match what the police officer sees. And so um, I was actually in the video for the training for tra on transgender people for the Seattle Police Department, and that that actually happened to me. He assumed that I had stolen someone's ID, and so um, you know, it's just these things that we take for granted sometimes. So even though we have come a long way since Stonewall in 1969, it's important to know that the kind of Folks who are now uh, actually coming into their own as elders, uh, we call them the LGBTQ elders. We call rainbow elders because it becomes really difficult to say all those letters all the time for folks. And uh, at Gen Pride, I talk a lot about them, but um, we now have a whole set of baby boomers who were the ones that were at Stonewall. The, that was, in fact, trans. Um, trans and queer uh, folks, uh, women of color, actually, uh, were the ones who started the Stonewall riots in 1969. And so we've got a long way to go. And marriage equality did some of that for us, but it certainly did not do all of that for us. So um, we're, we're all still here, but we all got, got lots to go. So that that riots that followed Stonewall um, actually were the first to kind of create a buzz of what this was all about. And it did create the lesbian and gay movement. And um, the next year, the, the parade that they had on Christopher Street was the very first pride parade. So that's kind of how that, that works. Um, now we've got uh, other movements that have come. The transgender movement has come from that. And, um, and also just an understanding of more about who we are as, as a more diverse set of people. So this is where the first chance you get to actually kind of exercise your, uh, your uh, ability to chat. And so I'm going to kind of ask Marisol to help with some of that. Um, but please just add in the chat. Um, did you know some of this history? Did you know it from popular media? Uh, was it perhaps from the lived experiences of people that you know that are gay, lesbian, bi, trans, or non-binary? Um, and what kinds of, what pieces of those stories were what impacted you the most? And I'm not actually seeing the chat, so I'm going to have to depend on uh, on you. If you could just maybe kind of summarize a couple of those comments as they come in, that would be helpful for me, Marisol. I saw I unmuted you. Yes. Thank you, Monica. Uh, there are no, there is a question coming. Uh, okay. this, this is from Lindsay Wall. Um, the stories of early arrests are the ones that impacted me the most. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Please feel free to use the chat if you have that function, uh, if you have that functionality available for you. That'd be great. Also, feel free to raise your virtual hand if you would like. Uh, we would be happy to just bring you up and so you can turn your camera on. Um, 
uh, if you would like to make a comment or ask a question live, we can also do that. And uh -huh. thank you, Council Member Walsh, for being here tonight. That's great. Yeah. So good to see that. Well, we'll kind of move along and uh, Marisol, I give you permission to to kind of um, step in if if you feel so moved um, as we go along. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the effects of some of those kinds of um, the treatment and discrimination and things that people live through through. Um, these are just some of the compounded effects of living through a system of systemic discrimination. I want to make it clear that that um, LGBTQ folks are not the only folks that live through systemic uh, discrimination by any means. Um, that you can substitute systemic homophobia for systemic transphobia, for systemic racism, for um, any of those things. So I in no way am meaning that that we are the only ones. But I think it's really important to understand that now in history, especially after COVID, we're seeing how um, we're seeing more globally and more uh, in, in a in a broader sense across the country as well, how much more we are alike than we are different. And that we've all have these effects uh, are coming in in terms of trauma. And now we're going to have some opportunities to heal some of those things in our lives. Um, and that's kind of cool because it's bringing them up so that we can raise them and and move on from there. Um, it, you know, this pervasive neg negative stigma kind of affected a lot of our oldest elders in terms of their living much of their lives in the closet. And now as they're aging and coming into the opportunity to live in, in um, facilitate in living situations where they're with each other, whether that's assisted living or independent living or adult family homes, or if they need more support or less support, um, any of those things, they were seeing that some of them are choosing to go back in the closet uh, if they have been out because they're afraid of the effects of how they'll be treated. Um, and it, when we hide our true identity, we're really resulting in being rendered invisible and isolated from other people. And it, it's not um, when we create those silos of people that we live uh, exactly like, that we work with, we, you know, all those little silos that we create, we don't create more connection, we actually create more isolation and, and invisibility. So um, just to kind of hone this, elders over the age of 65 are 83% less likely to come out as compared to LGBTQ people under the age of 30. Um, I'm going to uh, actually bring you to another kind of set of, of adults and within the people of the rainbow, another segment. And this is another along the lines of kind of taking the perspective of or learning about how to live uh, in the headspace of, of being uh, a trans person. All right, let me see if uh, the boys would like to do anything tonight. Looks like they beat me to it. Oh, heck yeah, I want to go out and have some fun. It's the weekend, baby. This night is amazing. What? Two cubicles, both out of water. It's not both of them. What am I going to do? Uh, no, I thought I saw the banks and I missed me enough to take this. Hello? Yes, hello, it's Bond. Who's speaking? Yes, I know I don't sound like the hand you expected, but this is how I can't believe that. Uh, 
but this is just exhausting. It's been a long day. I don't want to go through this every time. No one else has to go through this. Here we are again at the doctor. But I hate being here. They know I'm not supposed to be here. I know I'm not supposed to be here. No. Oh my God, I don't know. Why am I just frozen here sitting at this wall? Please just move. Is he looking over here? If I drop my towel now, he's definitely going to know I'm trans. Crazy. Oh, jeez. There could be another bathroom we could use. In the neutral. It's going to get people to leave because of me. It's another night ruined. Another weekend. I think they're the gynecologists. God, I hate using that word. I told you it's me, just believe me. Why don't I just spell my name? It doesn't make a difference. It's not going to be Hannah. I'm still Hannah. No, not so, not so, not so. I'm never so a miss. A beautiful day. Oh, I love London in the summer. I need to just get to the shops for five. So that should be good too. I'm looking forward to staying in for once. God, what's that ahead? Oh, a building's fine. Maybe I should have gone around the other way. What if they get some trans? Yeah, I'm just gonna get the usual looks, the usual comments. Is he smiling at me? Yeah, still smiling. He's cute. Things must be changing. So that was a little bit of the headspace from that. Um, I want to let you know that Jake Graff is actually a filmmaker, a transgender man filmmaker, and he was featured in that. He was the particular actor that was in the gynecologist's office. So um, just a little bit of a, a clue about things that we live through every day. So I want to also mention that youth are just as, uh, just as susceptible to the kinds of things uh, that trauma causes. Every school day, 160,000 school-age kids decide to not go to school because they uh, rather stay home than face uh, a bully. So bullying, it causes issues with drugs and alcohol and coping mechanisms that may or may no longer serve us as adults, um, leads to low self-esteem, deep-seated rage, revenge, uh, and most LGBTQ youth have experienced emotional, physical, or sexual abuse. Uh, and 40% of youths youth that are chronically unhoused actually do identify as being within this rainbow uh, spectrum. So um, I'm going to actually give you just a moment to reflect about some of those things that you saw and thought about and what, what came up to your mind as, hmm, I bet we could do better. I bet there's some things that I could do to make it easier, to make someone's experience easier, to make someone, uh, to cause less trauma in the lives of my fellow human beings in, in some way or another. Um, can some of you just pop in the chat some of the answers that you might think of, just really easy things like, um, 
like being able to connect to other LGBTQ organizations in and around town, um, connecting to cross-generational opportunities for youth, adults, uh, feel free, chat away, just mark those things up. Um, you could look at arranging events that do support a broader range of people when we talk about inviting partners or spouses or um, uh, kinship groups. Oftentimes, uh, the folks that are supportive for LGBTQ, whether it's elders or just um, just other adults, uh, the most supportive environment are friends and are often a chosen family for uh, our people of the rainbow. So are we getting some some answers there? Yes, yes, we are. Right. Can you just well, read a few of them out loud? Of course. Uh, one of them is from Hannah. It says proper pronouns used make that a norm to share in an email or introduction. Um, cool. Council member Walsh uh, shared a school could provide gender neutral bathrooms. Mm -hmm. um, another one, doctor's office could arrange for days or hours where they could let trans folks go directly to a room rather than stalling in the waiting room. Another one, uh, treat them like any other human being with love and tender loving care. That sounds great. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, demonstrating respect. And uh, again, we've, we've been kind of doing that all along by climbing into this experience of another culture. Um, it's important to, to understand that it often comes with a common vocabulary, a language, experiences, you know, uh, um, and that happens no matter what kind of culture we're talking about, right? So if we're talking about different races or cultures that may have a different language, they may have different experiences that everybody knows about, whether those be ethnic or cultural experiences of foods that they eat, kinds of holidays you celebrate. And all is the same for this cultural group that we call this LGBTQ cultural groups, right? So we're different too. And even though, um, you know, Brene Brown talks about this uh, guarding against this sorting people into silos of the same, like people that we work with, um, that we that we live we live in the same space. We um, we work with the same kinds of people that believe the same things that we do. We go to religious services or spiritual communities that, that believe the same thing. We, uh, we play and we have activities and live in neighborhoods the same. So even at the same time, we're guarding against that kind of silo effect. At the same time, we have to understand this. We have to sort of balance this thing about creating safe space where people can gather and can feel that connection of sameness that, that we do have with each other, just as is true for other cultures and holidays. Um, and we wanna you know, demonstrate respect for um, people's different identities, for the relationships that they have, whether those are validating and valuing um, relationships that may be partnerships and not marriages. Um, the celebrations and rituals that people have, whether those be, you know, uh, um, anniversaries. Uh, every year I celebrate my maniversary, which is on February the 2nd. It's the day that I had um, in 2002 that I had my first um, I didn't actually have a shot. I had testosterone through androgel, but that becomes my maniversary. But, you know, I've introduced that into my uh, my circle of friends and even to my identity on Facebook. So people actually know that that's a thing. So. Um, so it's all those kinds of things. So this is another question for you uh, on the chat. Uh, we're going to kind of move into an area of, of language, and someone mentioned pronouns a moment ago. We're going to talk a little bit about language so that we feel comfortable walking into the language uh, that, that maybe another group of folks has. Um, 
So most folks, nine out of 10, know somebody who's lesbian, gay, bi, or queer. And you know, that's because we had marriage equality and people found out that it was important that we share our lives and our stories so that you could know us. So you could know that we are more alike than we are different. And so um, I'm now gonna ask you, do you know anybody who's trans, non-binary, or transitioning, whether that's an adult, a youth, uh, children, uh, friends of friends, uh, somebody from your classroom, somebody from your school, uh, from church, from anywhere? So just a yes or, yes or no works. And just kind of, um, kind of to usually, the numbers that we get are are kind of like the number of people who knew someone lesbian, or gay, bi, or queer in the old days were like two or three out of ten. Um, but now it's nine, nine or ten, nine or so, or maybe all ten people that would ask would know someone. So a lot of times these numbers for trans and non-binary folks are more along the lines are two or three out of ten or so. So. Um, we're going to move right along into um, a, a video, and I'm going to set this up a little bit. Um, there'll be two people in an interviewing situation, and um, and see if you don't find out something interesting about this interview. It kind of maybe um, uh, there's a little bit of a of a switcheroo that happens along here, and we'll talk about it briefly afterwards. So I'm here with Alicia Menendez. First off, you're beautiful. Thank you. And what's so amazing about you is that if I were to look at you, I would have never not known that you weren't trans. So who was the first person you told your sister? I have never been asked or felt the need to tell anyone that I was cis. Do you have a vagina? When was the moment that you felt your breast budding? Did you use tampons? I thought we were going to show. Well, I think we need to get through this. These are just the preliminary questions. When you were going through puberty, did you feel trapped by the changes your body was going through? Did you feel like a girl? I don't even know what that would feel like because I was told that I was. Do you feel that your, your idea of self, your cisness, holds you back in any way? Just the one thing. What do they need to know about cis people? I think you're incredibly brave to be a cisgender woman as well. Thank you so much for joining. Oh, that was so. Wait, that was awesome. Thank you. Like I actually, we we wrote a lot of these questions, and I didn't realize how awful. Like even when we were role playing them without you, I didn't realize how awful and invasive some of them would feel, and how how um I feel now like a token. <laughs> Well, right. It's, it's, I think that that's kind of the experience I go through every single time I'm in an interview. And even the good ones, you know, I still feel as if I'm carrying the burden of people that they're expecting me to communicate all of these things, but then also to give off all this private information about my body and my journey and my life. And, you know, I am very open in my book, so I understand why I'm in that space. But at the same time, I think some of the questions aren't necessary, right? The questions about your body, why do we need to know that? When I was coming into this, I, I thought we needed to know that as a way of bridging an understanding gap. But when you have the questions turned on you, I understand how much more intimate those questions feel and how they get away from the identity piece of this, which for me has a lot to do with my body, but doesn't necessarily for everyone have to do with the physicality of their sex or their gender. Yeah, what I felt so interesting is how uncomfortable I felt asking, but also I came when I when I was asking the questions, I came from a space of entitlement of saying, you need to prove to me that your identity in your body is real. And I'm going to ask you these questions because I need to investigate and really make sure that your identity and your your body is real and authentic. Like that's where I was coming from. So it was, and I found myself taking on that that role. And I kept on going to the default because I've heard this so many times. Well, our, our viewers really want to know. This is something people want to know. And it's like, no, you want to know. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not really like your viewers want to know, but it's an easy space to kind of go to. Yeah, wow. Okay, thank you for that. Okay. 
Okay, just real quickly, I want to make sure that everybody kind of got the context of that. Janet Mock, who is speaking at the end, is actually a trans activist, and um, she's also an author. She is an actor. She's very well known. And Alicia Mendez was there to interview her. And when Janet Mock started asking the questions, it allowed Alicia Mendez to realize how inappropriate some of those questions actually are. And I, I share this by way of letting you know that, um, that there are some questions that, uh, that trans or non-binary folks may feel are inappropriate and uh, are invasive. And those are questions that are best left for someone like me or someone who uh, offers you the opportunity to ask those type questions. But really, we're going to talk a little bit about gender as a construct. Uh, for for many of us, we you know we grew up with the idea that gender is um, it is male you're, you're male or female you're a boy or a girl and we all know that um, at some point in our lives and are socialized that way growing up. Now. Um, I mentioned that I had talked to my mom when I was five years old. Uh, most people know who they are within themselves, who they, who they, who they, who, what their gender identity is and who they are inside themselves, who they know themselves to be within the ages of four and six. So that's why there are so many parents now who are supporting children that are even that young in some of their choices. And, you know, Children's Hospital helps work with that. So it's not just like it's I'm just playing this role, this something that is persistent and insistent and consistent over time. So um, we talk about gender as a construct. We talk about sex as being the physical bits. Your your um, it's actually the uh, physiological bits, uh, your genitalia. It's what's in your pants. So I kind of think about this as the the end of the uh, fortune cookie, and the, uh, um, uh, that you know we all used to add the phrase in bed. Well, to this stuff, I add in your pants. So basically, sex is the physical bits in your pants. Gender idea uh, or ID or your identity is who you know yourself to be inside your pants who you know that and you, you're just solid on that. Your gender expression is how you wear your pants. Like, you know, do you put flowers on them, patches? Are they short shorts? Are they long shorts? You know, how do you, how do you express who you are as the gender you believe yourself, um, you identify yourself and, as? And your sexual identity is what you do and with whom when your pants are off. So sexual identity is something that's really, really very different than gender identity. And so even though we have those letters that go LGBTQ, the L's, the G's, the B's, and some of the Q's are really the only ones that talk about your sexual orientation or your sexual identity. Um, the ones that don't is transgender and also some of the cues. Now, there are also letters that come after that, and some of us refer to that as alphabet soup or the continued alphabet uh, connection. Um, there's another Q for queer or questioning. There's an I for intersex. There's A for asexual. And more and more terms are being coined as people live their lives. There's pansexual, poly, uh, polyamorous, there's, um, anyway, more and more and more. But the important thing is you can't judge a person's insides by their outsides. So um, uh, the idea about sexual orientation and, um, and gender identity is that I have one of each and all of you have one of each. So my gender identity is transgender man. I identify as male if there are only two choices. 
I only, I pick the male because that's how I identify. I do identify as a very binary, uh, either or. Um, I, I transition for that very reason uh, that I am male. I also identify as a gay man, which means that I am sexually attracted to and interested in, in men as a choice. Um, so being gay doesn't mean you're transgender and being transgender doesn't mean you're gay. You've got, you've got all these separate things that are. And cisgender is the term that's just used to say you're not transgender. So you're cisgender. And, and there is an, um, there is language that goes along with that, but uh, historical connection with that comes from biology in Latin. We're going to look a little bit about pronouns. I go by she, her, and hers pronouns. That's just how it's been for me. My pronoun is he, and I present as a he. Some trans people like, might look like me and present as a she. Recently, I've come across they, and I, I like they. So you can refer to me either as she or they. I like to be referred to as many things. It's really about what sort of feels good to our ears when we hear it. Pronouns are important because they indicate a degree of respect. Who doesn't want to be? respected. For a long time, a lot of people have felt like that they don't fit into the mold of primarily he or primarily she, or maybe they feel they're a blend of both and that there's not really a word for that. I found out about gender nonspecific pronouns, Z and here, and I thought that was funny. That makes people trip up because really technically I'm not a she. Uh, not a he either. There are some situations where we really put way too much stock into whether or not somebody is a man or a woman. Um, there's a lot of situations that we just don't need to necessarily have gendered language. If you're unsure about somebody's pronoun, you know, pull them aside and ask, you know, hey, what are your pronouns? So it's not even preferred pronoun because it is their pronoun. So some people go by he, some people go by she, some people actually use uh, the pronoun they. You can avoid mistakes by just saying them, theirs, they. Their gender is still valid regardless of whether or not you understand it. Misgendering a person by using an incorrect pronoun is an act of disrespect. Everybody else in the world out there can say, I am, and they identify themselves. And everybody believes them. But when I say, I am, I don't, I don't know why people just don't believe us. Laverne Cox is a trans activist and has stated numerous times that misgendering a person is an act of violence. Um, now, I want to... I want to make sure that you guys separate the thought of misgendering is not the same as making a mistake. Misgendering is an intentional choice to continue to refer to someone by pronouns that are other than those that they asked for um, in terms of really trying to create uh, a sense that you know better than they what the world is and what their experience should be. So misgendering is not just, I made a mistake and I'm trying to do this right. I just didn't get it right. Okay. Um, we talked about gender pronouns. Now it's important to know that many languages other than English um, that don't even have pronouns. Some have pronouns that they, they have a neutral pronoun that they use. Uh, some some languages, uh, there there are no pronouns, and so they, so folks that have that background as their first language oftentimes have trouble understanding or knowing how to use pronouns correctly anyway. But uh, I do want to mention this idea of they, them, and theirs. Now, um, the Washington Post and the New York Times both uh, declared by their um, editorial departments that in fact they, them is used as a singular pronoun. 
And frankly, if you'd like to do a little bit of research, it has been used that way since the 1800s. So we just think that because we learned in school one way that it's not singular. Uh, but I'm going to challenge you now. Um, there's a barista that I send everybody to. Theirs are the best, the best lattes in town. They make it with the with the prettiest kind of flowery designs. Uh, theirs theirs is the best, and I send everyone to them. So, in situations where we're not really sure or don't have an intimate connection to people, oftentimes we use the pronoun they to refer to a single person somebody left a coat in the in the office the other day they're going to be really surprised when they go outside and find out it's too chilly for them to hang out without their coat okay it's one coat it's one person so i'm just challenging you now that i've i've pointed out that our brains do that you'll begin to recognize all the times that you use they as a singular pronoun and you'll be able to practice and do better. So the questions, how, how would you like for me to refer to you or what pronouns do you use? Those are the questions you can ask. And um, what's your personal pronoun as opposed to preferred pronoun again? And if you can't remember, just use the person's name. Just call me by my name. That's what I used to call my presentations. Just call me by my name. All right. Um, now it's really important to do to do this part of it. And this is how to mess up. There's it's not a question of if you'll mess up. It's a question of when. So I want you all to know how to mess up. So acknowledge it. Oh, I messed up. You just told me to use they pronouns and I and I did it again. Listen, I'm really sorry. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write this down on your chart. I'm going to write this down in this piece of paper so that I get it right and I have a reminder next time. And um uh and and I, you know, and move on. Move on. It's kind of like um we're, we're not going to dwell on it. We're not going to make a big deal out of it. We're not going to make it this mea culpa and, you know, you know, oh my God, I did it, you know. No, because that's all, that all takes it on to you as an issue rather than actually honoring the person that you're talking to. So you just move on. Um, it's kind of almost like somebody comes in the room and you notice their flies down. You might want to say, hey, you know, you might want to zip it up. And then you go on, right? They zip it up and they go on. You don't make a big to-do about it. So what are some ways that we can actually signal respect for transgender folk? And that can come in the sense of um, acknowledging by signs, um, uh, acknowledging by pronoun pins or wearing a pronoun pin. Um, when you introduce yourself, um introduce yourself first hi my name is mitch i go by he him pronouns um how can i help you or and when you open that door up that way that gives someone the idea that hey they are a little clued in and they know what they're talking about so i'm going to be able to be a little bit more comfortable and say uh hi my name is uh is, is sally and i use she her pronouns or i use uh they them pronouns um having some sort of way of showing that you have a clue about that is is most important for folks all right so i'm going to give the opportunity to um two people to practice this out loud two really really brave people if you want um i i'd like to ask um Marisol and if and Hannah, if you can kind of watch for people that might raise their hand, because I don't have that option, and uh, call on a couple of people. And uh, what I'm going to ask you to do is introduce yourself using your own personal pronoun, and then ask another person for theirs. And you get a real big bonus if if your pronouns are they, or if you'd like to actually try on that option to introduce someone else. So um, I'm gonna give give you guys a couple of minutes and I know that you're just, um, I know you're just 
chomping at the bit to go for this and practice this. This is a safe place. So there's no big mistakes. Nobody's gonna, there's, you know, no harm, no foul. Nobody gets hurt here, okay? We have someone who raised their hand. Okay. Welcome, Council Member De Michel. Thank you for raising your hand. I'm going to bring someone else up here. Give me just a moment. Thank you for being brave. And thanks for sticking with me through all this. I'm really proud of you guys. I know you're with me. I can feel it. Okay, and I think, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought I brought someone else up. Amir, I thought I brought you up. There you are. Yeah, I'm gonna try this out. All right. Okay, my name is Amir Shana. He, his, him. Um, and then in order to ask somebody else about their pronoun, I might say, what pronoun do you prefer? All right. What pronoun do you use or what's your personal pronoun? Right? Perfect. Yeah. I'll jump in and respond. Hi, Amir. Nice to meet you. My name is Lindsay Walsh. I use she, her pronouns. Thanks for asking. Mm -hmm. Great. You guys, that was so smooth. I appreciate that. <laughs> Very good. Anybody else just just chomping at the bit to try? I know Monica's good with that. I would like to try. Okay. Hi, my name is Marisol Cesar, and I use she, her, ella as pronouns. Very well, can I ask what the ella as a pronoun means? It's a Spanish for she. Thank you for asking. Fantastic. There, um, there is a variation of that word that there are some very uh, enterprising youth that are Hispanic Latinx that use um, that use that uh, a term, uh, a variation of that of ella, um, and I think it's nuance so i don't think i did it right but there's a nuance in the in the pronunciation that's a little bit different and they um they actually use the pronoun as a gender uh, neutral uh, pronoun for them or transgender so yeah mitch cool. can i go yes okay you? and uh my name is hannah and i do use she her hers pronouns however i really do want to try and put myself in somebody else's shoes and use the bonus pronouns. Um, I, I think it would be helpful for me to understand what it's like saying they, them. So hello everyone, my name is Hannah and I use they, them and their pronouns. Great. Yeah, thank you. It's nice to meet you. Uh, I've had the best experience working with them uh, in terms of being a help and a support for me during this uh, during this time. So thank you, Hannah. Thank you. See what I did there? Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's go. Let's move on a little bit here. We're going to talk about promoting inclusion. And these are just things um, I realize that we have some folks who are actually residents of Issaquah. I also realize we have some governmental folks here. Yay. Thank you, council people. Um, I also want to uh, to recognize the employees of the city. So I know that um, that not all of these things are are going to be things that are within your purview or per purvey purview. Anyway, that are not under your control that you may not be able to do right. But I'm going to suggest uh, I'm I'm going to identify some of these things and. Then in, in other environments that you're around, you'll start noticing these things and you'll start saying, you know what? 
hey, um, I went to work and I work at Whole Foods or I work at this other place and maybe there's a better way to do this or maybe we could have some sort of signage or postering or signaling in some way that we're welcome and inclusive um, in our departments, on our desks, you know, maybe I'll wear a pin that's a, that's a rainbow pin or, you know, that identifies in some way um, the community that, that I'm aware and that I want to be welcome and inclusive. So um, all these spaces, these are just ideas for you. Many of these are the ones that you came up with earlier. So you're already on top of things. I really appreciate that. Gender neutral restrooms are things that you can do. I don't know what the city of Issaquah policy is, but I was instrumental in helping with the city of Seattle's policy on gender neutral restrooms and you'll find a variation of the way that that's done. But mostly as long as you have um, a single use restroom, a door that locks, uh, even a stall door that locks. In some cases, um, people are comfortable with identifying that as a gender neutral space. And then maybe the place that you wash your hands or you come out is maybe a little bit more open. The Starbucks Roasteria downtown uh, at the Soto Center is really very different that way. They have uh, individual rooms that lock the door. Then you come out and you wash your hands, you know, along with everyone else. And, and when you enter the space, you enter with men and women and everybody and you just wait for the next vacant spot, right? So, um, data intake forms, uh, you can really look at the way that we identify uh, we call it SOGI data, that's sexual orientation and gender identity on forms and intake um, kinds of things like, number one, is it really important? Do you really need that information? Number one. Number two, if you do, make sure that it is inclusive and it's asked in a way that's appropriate. Uh, we're working with King County. Jen Pride works on a grant with King County. We're working with them right now to, as we educate each uh, senior center that we're involved with. We're also working with King County is as a rule because they've asked for data and they've done it in a way that's maybe not as positive as we'd like to see it. So we're working with them. So, you know, there's there's changes afoot for everyone and we're all a part of that. Um, signage that you can post. Uh, there are different kinds of ways of doing this. The safe place program from the Seattle Police Department, we were instrumental in working with them when I was on the commission to get that uh, to get that up and running in town. Yeah. Can I interrupt here? We have a question and it's actually about what you are talking about. Okay. From Council Member Walt. Can you talk a little bit about the work you did with Seattle for gender neutral bathrooms? What was the scope? Who were the decision makers and what was the result? Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you to give that to me in the parts because I caught the first one. So what was the first part of the question? Can you tell, tell us about the work you did with Seattle for gender neutral bathrooms? What was the scope? Who were the decision makers? And what was the result? The scope of the work um, entailed writing up legislation that we could present to the mayor um, so that they could take a look at that. And I say they because it went over more than one mayor before we were actually entertained uh, in terms of our request from the Seattle LGBT Commission. Um, uh, it took three years for our request to kind of come up to that space. And the way that they did was a really roundabout way. We had another committee that the mayor actually formed and the commission made it clear that this was our recommendations for the LGBTQ community uh, and this other committee that the mayor formed actually presented our ideas to the mayor. So that's how it actually came into being. Um, uh, we actually wrote up the, you know, the legislation to present so that the mayor could um, just make that, um, you know, this is what we're going to do. The scope of it was within um, any kind of place of public accommodation is required, and this is this is actually how it works, is required to put signage up indicating gender neutral restroom if in fact they have a single use restroom. So in other words, if you're um, a restaurant 
and you have one door that locks with a stall even if you have a urinal in that stall that that also has a toilet so it could be the door can lock and that can be a single use and therefore your signage needs to be say that it's a gender um neutral uh, restroom and the city uh human uh mm, one of the city departments actually has the signage that can be sent out to anybody and it was a postcard and it can be used and slapped up um, now there's there's stuff everywhere um, it did take quite a bit of work for the city buildings uh, because they had to be retrofitted and we had to work with uh, the 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 parks department we had to work with individual departments to see how that could be um, instituted within different city things so I'm happy to consult with you offline too. So, um, creating these safe spaces also means being aware of and attending to the needs of people in general. There are some people who uh, go all day without, without eating or drinking so that they don't have to use a public restroom so they won't be assaulted or harassed when they go in the restroom that is of their choosing where it may not be what someone else wants to see from them so um when that happens uh um there in the the transgender survey in 2015 said that more than half 59 percent of respondents avoided even using a public restroom because they were afraid of confrontations or some sort of problems nearly a third of those people limited you know um limited what they ate or drank so that they didn't have to use the restroom and um eight to ten percent of those folks uh really had urinary tract infections and other signs types of kidney infections and things so it it actually affects our health in that and can you imagine being a kid and just not eating and drinking all day and just holding it because you don't want to have to go to some special restaurant uh, restroom in the principal's office or something or the teacher's lounge or something like that it can just be a pain so um we're coming up to really uh not a lot of time but i'm just going to mention real quickly some of the services that we offer and programs we offer through gen pride so you know a little bit more about that in case you'd like to refer some of your elders that you know to that um we turned all of our programming online uh, in the last year and um, the types of programming that we have is uh, health and wellness and um, we had a cooking class and we also did a writer's workshop. We produced um, an anthology out of the folks that were in that writer's workshop and this is a book that you could get for a lending library or for the library in town um, and it's just the experiences of different LGBTQ elders um as they wrote and and did this workshop with this incredible instructor um this author very well known um woman who just is an incredible teacher um we moved our cooking classes yoga strength and balance qigong classes are all online and so those are all things that you could do um i'm gonna kind of skip over this question other than um, the fact that I do want you to think about, because I'm going to ask it to you in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to think about what your one takeaway from today's presentation is, while I tell you just a little bit about why we celebrate pride. And we celebrate pride because we are resilient. Despite all odds and injustices, we found each other We've created vibrant communities and we've not just survived, but we've thrived. Even through these COVID times, we learned how to reach out to each other, hold a stranger's hand and march together. We learned how to make a stand with others, to walk beside them, to lift up their voices and their needs. We're still here and we're working to create a more just and equitable future that we can all live into. So I'd like for you 
to just take a moment in the chat to um, I want to thank you for your time and your uh, and your attention. I know it's been kind of long and it's been hot, but I know you've been with me every bit of the way. So uh, what's your one takeaway from today? What are you going to do differently now that you know more? Uh, maybe it's talk to your boss. Maybe it's talk to some of the people. Maybe it's create a um, uh, work, talk to other people, maybe create an affiliation group or maybe consider being a part of and an active part in the equity, diversity, and inclusion efforts within the city of Issaquah. I know that's how I got first introduced to this, to uh, being asked to present. So I know there is a group and I know they're working really hard to develop um, further programs to, um, to uplift equity and diversity and inclusion within all kinds of different cultures and makeups within the city. Um, so what are you gonna do differently? What's your takeaway? And I'm just going to ask you to put those in the chat. And then, um, Mitch, we have yeah. a couple of questions. Can we bring them? Okay, give me just a second. I'm going to finish up and I'll and I'll open up to questions. Um, I just want to let you know that the next steps that we'll do is I will, um, as a result of registering for this presentation, I will send out an evaluation that you'll be able to to fill out in just a couple of days. And um, so that you can tell me a little bit more about the presentation, it's, it won't take you more than five minutes. It is not, it's not a big, long involved thing. Um, and just consider what it is that you might and what next steps you might wanna do to move this work forward. Cause I know you're chomping at the bit to actually do something with all this great information that you've learned. And I just wanna remind you that there is a vitality, a life force, an energy, a quickening that is translated through you into action. And because there's only one of you in all time, this expression is unique. And if you block it, it will never exist through any other medium and will be lost. So please be all you can be, be who you are and be proud of that. And I'm gonna actually ask you guys to, can you set up the poll and I can start answering questions in addition to that? Do, will that work? Can I talk over the poll? I think it, I think I can still talk while you're doing that, right? I think you can, yes. Okay, let's do that. Let's br bring up the poll and uh, and I do want to tell you that I will continue to answer questions. I do know that we're about three minutes till the end of time. And so that should give you time to fill out this poll. But I will let you know that I will, um, as long as I am, you are open to having the meeting open, I will spend the next few minutes um, uh, after that, I can spend another 10 minutes or 15 even um, answering questions for folks and being willing to do that. But I do want to make sure that folks know that with this poll, I will say, um, I will say thank you to you for your time. And I'll just remind us, uh, remind you that I'm here from Gen Pride. And my address is um, for email or anything is just Mitch at genprideseattle.org, all one word. So if the folks that have questions can either do that at the same time that they're answering the poll or have some sort of thing, go right ahead and do that. And I'm willing, I know, Hannah, you're doing the poll, right? Okay, so Marisol can do the the question and answer, right? Yes, we I divide, have the question. Yeah, we, we divided up labor good enough. Okay, good, mm -hmm. good deal. Great. So we have one from Jen David. And uh, her question is, how do you collect data for SOGI by not just only using male and female choices? Well, for SOGI, for SOGI data, thank you for asking that, sexual orientation and gender identity. My, um, 
my push is always for a little bit more than just male or female. Um, if you have that capacity, there, it depends on where your data reporting is. I'm aware that some national um, some national data reporting sites do not have um, a choice other than other. But I do want to point out that in this state, not only do we have an other, but we have an identity on our legal identification on our driver's license for the letter X. So I do want to let you know that legally, we actually should be kind of collecting that information because we have that option. And yet some of our systems have not caught up to the um, to the actual to our actuality and, and the legal opportunities for that. So um, sometimes just an other blank is good, but the problem is people um, don't want to identify as other. So sometimes you can say male, female, or transgender, and then you can have a second question. If transgender, um, you know, non-binary, uh, you can kind of say transgender man, transgender woman. Um, there, there are a couple of different ways. Um, early on, there was a suggesting of, of how you were assigned, how your sex or your uh, was assigned at birth. And that's actually kind of not considered uh, very appropriate anymore, because really there's no reason for bringing that up to people and shoving that in their face, basically. So, um, you know, I can I can work with people uh, on that and can provide you some background information. But sometimes you have to work within the systems that you've got and just push for the edges for what you can do and what kinds of choices you can make. So. Thank you very much. Um, another question from um, Council Member Walls. Is there a polite gender neutral or inclusive term to use instead of sir or madam in a professional situation? That's a very good question. In fact, I, um, I work with uh, places that make appointments and, um, and for hospital systems, in other words, and we ask them to stop using sir or ma'am because uh, you can't always tell when someone's calling in who they are. Um, I have heard the term uh, gentle thems and uh, themdies, themdies and gentle thems. I've heard that. Um, I have heard that through uh, Microsoft and Amazon and some other folks. Um, so just different ways of of creating um, an acknowledgement that someone might be different other than a sir or a ma'am. And I'm an advocate for removing that in terms of being um, a prefix on a lot of our a lot of our address labels and things like that still have a prefix where you have to have Mr. or Ms. or ma'am or doctor or whatever. And I just, there's really not a lot of reason for that prefix thing. So good question. Really astute. I, you got some kudos there for that one. We have another question if there's time. Why do you think youth are more likely to come out versus seniors? Mostly because of history, uh, there's been so much more um, uh, ways that that's kind of a, a little safer. There's support for youth now to be able to come out. But the interesting thing is, and one statistic that I didn't kind of pummel you over the head with, but uh, there are two populations of people that are transitioning at a higher rate. It is youth and it is seniors. And that's by seniors, I mean over the age of 65. And over the age of 80 is even higher, but that could be that the that the population um, um, scanned or surveyed are is a smaller population. So that also could be the reason for that. But over 65 is quite a bit more. Um, and one of the reasons why they're uh, trans 
trans and non-binary folks are coming out at a later age is because oftentimes they have satisfied whatever relationship um, issues they may have. They may have children that are grown now that they no longer feel a responsibility to either keep that from or to that it will cause problems within their family structure. Uh, they may have a spouse who has passed on. Um, they may uh, they may have a, a more access to financial resources, so they may be able to make choices in terms of a medical or a surgical transition that they didn't have options to before. And it's a little bit more acceptable. And that's why I think it's so important that we start working with community centers, senior centers, senior community centers, senior service organizations to understand that this group of, um, of baby boomers are going to be hitting. And they, you know, baby boomers were known for pushing the envelope everywhere and every time that we made a step along the way. And we vote with our money. So if you want your, if you want more services, if you want more people coming in, you have to understand you're going to just have to come in and understand that 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 your services have to be inclusive and have to really speak to that opportunity and the chance that you are going to get folks that are are not maybe who you are expecting to see. Great. Thank you so much, Mitch. We really appreciate your time. Marisol, is there any, any other questions or any any other comments? There are a lot of comments and um, some of them. Thanks for having this event. Um, the conversation was amazing. Um, I'm going to talk to my friend who goes by them day and ask them about their experience and I want to learn some personal stories. My takeaway from my mom, ask a place of business why they don't have gender neutral bathrooms. This will remove the need for choice that causes micro trauma. Um, I take away, I would like to encourage my coworkers to use pronouns at work as a sign of respect to the LGBTQA plus community. My takeaway, they, them, is in plural. Thank you for this thoughtful presentation and discussion. Thank you so much. This Thank was, you. Mitch, this is such a wonderful educational um, presentation that you provided for us. I want to just say thank you for even your personal stories. Um, it just means a lot uh, when you put that personal touch and, and helps us understand you and understand this community better um, that we want to be inclusive to. So this is a wonderful event. We just want to say thank you again for everybody to, for joining us this evening. And thank you again, Mitch, for, for presenting a wonderful presentation. You're very welcome. Thank you for asking me. And I really want to give a nod to my uh, Cracker Jack team here that supported me all the way through Monica and all the getting me to the meetings on time and to all the trial things and Hannah and Marisol for all your work um, during this and making it really smooth. And I felt supported all the way through. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Such an honor to have you. And thank you so much for those of you who were able to join us tonight. Have a good evening and, and stay cool. Um, if you know anyone in the next few days as the temperatures rise, um, please keep in mind that the community center will be open this Saturday and Sunday as a cooling place. So please share uh, with your friends, neighbors, uh, whoever might need a, a place to cool down a little bit and stay safe. And again, thank you so much for joining. Mitch, such an honor. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Are we out with the recording? Uh, <laughs> that's a good reminder. Let, let me get us out <laughs> and stop. Now we are out. <laughs>